Welcome everyone to another presentation in our sustainable landscaping series. Today, I will be talking about issues associated with certain plants and the advantages of using other shrubs. We'll begin looking at eight invasive shrubs and native alternatives to those. Then we'll take a look at six benign but overused non-native shrubs and their native alternatives. And we'll continue looking at 11 additional native shrubs. I'll take a few moments to discuss some best practices for installing your shrubs. I'll show you some photographs with examples of lovely foundation plantings that use these native shrubs. And we'll finish up with some resources. Walking around my neighborhood, these are the typical plants that I see used as foundation plants. Yu nandina, euonymus, Japanese barberry, azalea, cherry laurel, burning bush. Unfortunately, there are some issues with these typical foundation plantings. First of all, this is a very limited palette of shrub species. And that limited palette doesn't contribute to biodiversity. That means that if a disease, say a blight or an insect pest like emerald ash borer comes on the scene, a great many plants can be wiped out and affected uh, by those. These plants uh, are all introduced from Europe, Asia, and Africa. They're not native and none of them has involved with the local fauna. In addition, some of these plants have growth or disease problems, and some, in fact, are invasive. Invasiveness is defined in two presidential executive orders, and they state that non-native species are introduced to the ecosystem, and these invasive plants can escape from cultivation into natural areas where they cause harm to the environment or to human, animal, or plant health. Invasive plants don't just grow aggressively in our own gardens. They can escape from cultivation. Here's an example just from my own neighborhood. On this wall is a butterfly bush growing. You see a, an enlargement of that in the insert. And the next thing I knew, this entire new shrub had appeared in a curb cut across the street. It was not planted by the residents there. Invasive plants can spread. Uh, when animals, wind, and water disperse their seeds. These plants can spread uncontrollably, not just in our neighborhoods, but into natural areas. And there they'll have a negative impact on the balance of local ecosystems. They do that by suppressing the native understory vegetation and therefore destroying the habitat for wildlife. And they do that in a number of ways. They tend to be prolific producers of seed. The seed germinates very readily. The plants reach maturity quickly. In addition, they can spread by rampant vegetative growth, sending out runners. They may also have what are referred to as allelopathic characteristics, sending out chemicals into the soil that prevents the growth of other plants. And climate change, unfortunately, gives advantage to invasives with increased carbon dioxide levels and milder winter weather. There are also issues with plant choices. Most nurseries and online sources offer predominantly non-native shrub species. Some of these institutions continue to sell species even identified as invasive. Some landscapers recommend invasive species, and information about invasive species is not widely available. I'd like to suggest that there are advantages to introducing native shrubs into your landscape. For one thing, they will greatly broaden your plant selection, thereby contribute to biodiversity. Native plants have adapted over a long period of time to our local climate, soil conditions, and hydrology, and they can easily replace overused and invasive non-native species. They have many ornamental qualities, beautiful blossoms, attractive, colorful fall foliage. Some of them are even evergreen. Even more importantly, 
These native plants provide support for local fauna. They offer nectar and pollen as food for our pollinators. They can serve as host plants for Lepidoptera. That means that the foliage of these plants will serve as nourishment for the important caterpillar stage of the butterflies and moths that we want to see in our landscape. And they can also provide nutritious fruit and seeds for birds and other animals. Let's begin looking at some native alternatives to invasive shrubs. And you can follow along with the handout. A link has been sent for those of you who are attending now. And this resource will also be available on our website. You can follow along and then later on, follow the links that are embedded in the handout to get further information. Our first invasive shrub are the Asian viburnums. There are a number of species. These were introduced in the 1800s and they can spread very easily by birds carrying seed abroad. They'll form dense thickets in natural areas. They're in fact invasive throughout the mid-Atlantic. The notation Arlington and Alexandria refers to Arlington County and the city of Alexandria in Northern Virginia. In addition, these Asian viburnums can interbreed with our native cranberry. If you're looking for a shrub with fruit and fall color, I suggest arrowwood viburnum dentatum as an alternative. This is a rounded multi-stemmed shrub about six to 10 feet in height. It grows in sun to part shade and moist soil. It makes a wonderful use in shrub borders as a screen or a backdrop for other shorter native plantings. Arrowwood has toothed leaves as suggested by its species name, and these provide nourishment for the spring azure butterfly. I suggest you avoid cultivars with bright colored foliage because they will not be able to offer that support. Arrowwood has abundant flowers, April to May, and these will offer nectar for bees and butterflies. After pollination, you'll see the summer fruit for birds, and in the fall, beautiful red-orange fall foliage. Burning bush was introduced to the United States from Asia around 1860. This spreads prolifically by seeds spread by birds, and the seedlings, as you can see, form quite dense thickets. It will really dominate a forest understory, and it's now invasive from New England all the way to the Gulf Coast. If you're looking for a shrub with good fall color, I recommend Virginia Sweet Spire, Itea virginica. This is an upright, arching to rounded plant, six to 10 feet tall, and there are many smaller cultivars, among them Henry's Garnet, growing five to six feet tall, and Little Henry, two to three feet tall. These plants grow in sun to part shade and prefer moist to wet soil. This plant colonizes easily. That means it will send out runners from the sides, the lower part of the plant, as you see with little Henry there. And this can make it quite uh, useful as a hedge or for foundation plantings. Because of its preference for moist to wet soil, Virginia Sweet Spire is also well suited to rain gardens and slopes for erosion control. This is really a plant with four season interest. It has lustrous oval leaves that provide nesting habitat and cover. You'll see these lovely drooping flower clusters from May to June, and those attract bees, butterflies, and wasps. It has flaming fall color that rivals a burning bush, and in addition has lingering fruit into the winter for birds. Bush honeysuckle was introduced from Asia in the 1800s for wildlife cover. And as with the other invasive species, its seeds are dispersed by birds and small animals to form dense thickets in the forest understory. The blossoms of this plant will tend to lure pollinators away from our desirable native plants. And in addition, the fruit of the honeysuckles will not provide the proper nutrition for bird migration. These plants are now invasive from New England south all the way to Tennessee and North Carolina. 
I would recommend as a shrub with fragrant flowers, sweet shrub, also known as Carolina allspice, Calicanthus floridus. This is an upright multi-stemmed shrub, six to nine feet tall, that grows in sun to part shade and moist soil. Like some of the other plants, it can spread uh, to form colonies. It's useful by patios and shrub borders, as well as foundation plantings. Sweet shrub has leathery, aromatic leaves, and these will turn yellow in the fall. An outstanding feature are these showy strap-like flowers in April, and they have a fruity fragrance, something like strawberry and a little bit of citrus. A favorite of mine is the yellow-green Athens cultivar, which is especially long-blooming and has a particularly delightful scent. And then in the summer, you'll see this interesting urn-shaped fruit. Butterfly bush is a very popular plant, and unfortunately, it also is invasive. It was introduced from China in the early 1900s, and as I pointed out in that earlier slide, it can easily escape from cultivation. The issue with this plant is that while it does provide nectar to the adult butterflies, it cannot serve as a host plant for the important butterfly caterpillars. In other words, it's only supporting the adults. It will not support the new generation. And in fact, it does host a different insect, the brown marmorated stink bug. Another issue is that cultivars that are said to be sterile can sometimes revert to a fertile state and continue multiplying and reproducing in natural areas. This plant is now invasive throughout the Mid-Atlantic, as well as in Kentucky and Tennessee. If you're looking for another shrub, a native shrub attracted to butterflies, I recommend New Jersey tea, Ceanothus americanus. This is another upright multi-stem shrub, somewhat shorter, growing only three feet tall by about three to four feet wide. This grows in sun to part shade and prefers dry to moist soil. It's known for its massive deep root system, which makes it particularly drought tolerant. This adapts it for really good use for erosion control on dry slopes. You'll want to site this plant carefully if you do select it, because once it's settled in, it doesn't transplant well. New Jersey tea is another shrub with four season interest. Its leaves were used during the colonial period as a substitute tea when colonists were boycotting British tea. Speaking of nourishment, this serves as a larval host for butterflies. These lovely fragrant flowers appear in June and they'll offer nectar to bees and butterflies. When pollinated, they'll produce this interesting three-lobed fruit that offers seeds for birds. And then the yellow stems of New Jersey tea continue to be attractive on into the winter time. Japanese barberry was introduced from Japan in 1875 and forms very deep thickets in forests. It has a particular competitive edge as deer do not eat it. In our home gardens, it provides the perfect atmosphere for the breeding of deer ticks and the mice that host them. In addition, its thorny branches can make pruning something of a challenge. It's now invasive from New England to North Carolina. An alternative native shrub with arching habit and fruit is common nine bark, Physocarpus apulifolius. This is an upright multi-stemmed shrub with distinctly arching branches. It can range in height from three to 10 feet tall and quite wide, making it excellent for use as an anchor plant at the back of beds or as a screen. It grows in sun to part shade, dry to moist soil. Another plant with four season interest it begins its growth with lobed green leaves, and these will again serve as larval hosts. 
It has showy flowers for pollinators in May and very interesting summer fruit that lingers on for birds. In the winter time, you'll see this interesting exfoliating bark, which leads to the common name nine bark. Nine bark is particularly popular in the horticulture trade, and you will see many different cultivars with varying colors of foliage. These are very attractive to us, but just be alert that these cultivars won't support the caterpillar stage of our butterflies and moths. Japanese spirea introduced around 1870 to 1880 also can create dense colonies in natural areas with its seeds dispersed by water and remaining viable for years. This is invasive in the mid-Atlantic. If you would like another shrub with showy flower clusters, I recommend steeple bush, Spirea tomentosa, a native Spirea. This is a mound-shaped plant quite a bit shorter than some of the others we've mentioned, growing two to four feet tall. It grows in sun to part shade and likes moist to wet acidic soil. This makes it ideal for use in moist locations as a low hedge for paths or in foundation plantings. Steeple bush is another native shrub with four season interest. It has woolly leaves and serves as a larval host. You'll see these beautiful pink flower plumes in June. It does not offer nectar, but it does offer abundant pollen for our pollinating bees. And then in the fall, you'll see bright colored fall foliage and seed heads linger on into the winter. Another popular shrub in the horticulture trade is Nandina, introduced from Asia in 1804. This one not only spreads by seeds and rhizomes, but it can re reproduce from the merest root fragments. In our home gardens, the fruit of this plant, while attractive to us, is toxic to cats and cedar waxwings. This plant is now invasive in a wide swath from Virginia to Texas. For those looking for a shrub with attractive foliage and fruit, I suggest strawberry bush, Euonymus americanus. This is a very airy plant, a similar habit, multi-stemmed habit to the Nandina. It grows about the same height, four to six feet tall. It prefers partial shade and moist soil and a note that deer frequently damage this plant. So be alert if they uh, maraud in your particular garden area. This is a lovely plant for use along foundations as a hedge and is especially attractive when grouped on woodland margins. Strawberry bush has these subtle yellow-green flowers in May and then this stunning unique fruit, uh, a raspberry outer capsule and then day glow orange inner fruit that appears in late summer. And the plant continues to be attractive in fall with this dark red foliage color. Additional invasive shrubs are the privets, various ligustrum species. These were introduced from Asia in the mid 1800s and can create impenetrable thickets. It spreads both by suckers and re-sprouting from its roots. It's now invasive throughout the Southeast. For those seeking a dense shrub with fruit, I suggest possum haw, Viburnum nudum, another upright multi-stemmed shrub. This one grows five to 12 feet tall. It prefers sun to part shade and moist to wet soil. This is well adapted for use in borders or at woodland edges. And with its preference for moister soil, it's ideal for rain gardens or use by streams and ponds. Possum haw has the shiniest leaves of any of our native viburnums, and these will host the spring azure butterfly. It has very wide flower clusters. You'll see these from May to June, and bees seek pollen from them. It has beautiful multicolored fruit 
for birds. And the fruit becomes particularly attractive when set against this stunning fall foliage. Since I want to discuss many other shrubs, I'm uh, going to cut things short as far as the discussion of invasive shrubs, but I've provided links to these three fact sheets on autumn olive, leatherleaf mahonia, and rose of Sharon, so you can investigate these invasive plants uh, should you be interested. I'd also like to point out some resources on our MGNV website. I have an entire page that lists invasive plants and various management techniques for controlling them. We have a series of short videos that I've been creating with a colleague, Alyssa Ford Morrell, and I've introduced individual links to these various uh, short videos on your handout. Should you want to learn more about other types of invasive plants, there are two recorded presentations on our Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website. We can take a break here for any questions, Cheryl. Yes. First question, some viburnus are invasive and some are native. What is the best way to ensure they are getting the native viburnus? Well, the best thing to do would be to refer to the names that I've provided on your handout. You'll want to look and ask for these plants by their scientific name. The native-only sellers, and I'll be giving you information about those at the end, will always list the plants by this scientific name. And so if you see a name, for example, like Viburnum dentatum, Viburnum nudum, uh, you'll know that those are the native species. I listed the names of the, the various non-native species, Linden, T. viburnum, uh, Seabold. Those are the names, the common names of the invasive species. Okay, next question. I planted six ink berries and they start to have brown patches in the center. What is the problem? And uh, are there more hardy varieties uh, for ink berries? Okay, it's hard for me to know whether you've got the straight species or a cultivar. And I'd like to look a little further into what some possible causes of that browning could be. I usually answer questions that I don't answer fully in our live sessions in an addendum document that I send out to everyone. And I will do that at the end of the presentation. Uh, okay, next question. Are there any native alternatives to arborvitae? Arborvitae is a native shrub. So there isn't any question of invasiveness with that particular plant. We'll be continuing with quite a few additional native shrubs. And if you find that you don't care for arborvitae, you could perhaps uh, replace it with one of the ones that will be coming up. Okay, next question, boxwood replacements. Boxwoods are foundation plants. They get too big. They take off the uh, space. They are evergreen. Uh, what, what's your recommendation for? I will actually give a very specific recommendation in the very next section. Okay, one question. Can a single nine bark bear fruit? Yes, a single nine bark will have both the male and female components in its flowers, and it will be able to be pollinated and to have the attractive seeding. I'll be discussing uh, plants that come in both male and female plants, the so-called dioecious plants, a little bit further on in the conversation. Okay, May, uh, this question uh, is, uh, what kind of recommendation do you have for evergreen native shrubs for foundations? Okay, I'm going to be uh, going into a little bit of detail about inkberry. Because we have so many plants to discuss, I couldn't include absolutely every native shrub, but some other native shrubs that are evergreen are um, Great Bay uh, Rhododendron, Rhododendron Maximum, that's a fairly large plant, Leucothoe axillaris, a coastal dog hobble is a shorter plant, a fountaining plant, that one is evergreen too. 
and uh, I will provide detailed information about those plants with some resources when I send the addendum document out to everyone. So look for my discussion coming up about Ilex glabra, inkberry, and Calmia latifolia in just a few minutes. Do cultivars like Itea virginica, Cali, Candace, Florida support calabulus in birds, et cetera? Yes. Interestingly, I will be giving a talk in a couple of months going into very great detail about the differences between straight species and cultivars. But the ones I've mentioned, as long as the flowers are the same, they will provide all the support for our pollinators, they'll produce the fruit that can be enjoyed by birds. And I've pointed out the examples of plants where you would want to avoid the color change in the foliage, which would make them unusable as larval host plants for the caterpillars of butterflies and moths. This area has a lot of clay. Are there plants that survive in soil with the clay? Yes. Uh, particularly those that like the moisture to wetter soil, the ones that prefer dry would perhaps not prefer the clay. One thing you can do for clay soil, and you may want to watch some of our other uh, presentations on our MGNV website about soil, recommend the addition of organic matter. That will make the soil more nutritious for the plants. And in addition, it will improve the soil structure, allowing water to pass through more easily, and allowing air, oxygen, to be there for the roots of the plants as well. person bought several inkberries, but they seem to have a problem finding a male inkberry. So what is the best way to get a male inkberry? Well, the best way would be to try to look for a nursery that is a native-only nursery. They are going to be more likely to be aware of the fact that this is a dioecious plant and that you would need to have plants of both sexes. This person bought a shamrock, Ilex glabra, but it's not doing well. They're wondering if you can address the pros and cons or the uh, strength of each variety of inkberries. Okay, that could take quite a bit of time because there are many different cultivars, and that's another question that I would be very happy to research a little more thoroughly and answer in detail in writing. Would you be including in your talk or in your follow-up information about plants that attract hummingbird? Yes, yes, I'll be mentioning those as we go along. This person already has a variety of Ibona, but it's hard for them to tell exactly which one is the native and exactly which one is the Asian variety. I see. Okay, I'm trying to point out the details of some of our native ones. For example, the height of the black haw, Viburnum prunifolium, is quite tall. The Viburnum nudum has particularly shiny foliage that I pointed out, and those multicolored berries, in fact, they're shown here on this question slide. Viburnum dentatum has those very distinctive notched edges to the leaves. And I'll be talking about a few other types as we go along. But again, I can try to provide a little more information in that addendum document. Let's move on to the second section here, where I'm going to be introducing some native alternatives to other non-native shrubs. These are not invasive. These are benign, but they tend to be overused in our residential landscapes. The first are the Asian azaleas, rhododendron species, obviously native to Asia. They are absolutely stunning, as you see here in this photograph in the spring, but it's really just one season of interest, and it really is not going to be providing any support, certainly, for our local wildlife. Should you want uh, a shrub with attractive spring flowers that could be supportive of our wildlife as well, I recommend our native pinkster bloom azalea, rhododendron periclimenoides. This is a multi-stemmed suckering shrub. That means it can send out little runners to the side to allow it to spread. It grows about three to six feet tall. It prefers part shade or dappled sunlight. One important thing to note about this plant is that it is a so-called ericaceous plant. That means it's in the heath family and prefers distinctly acidic soil. So you would want to do a soil test and make sure that your local soil pH is in the 4.5 to 5.5 range to allow this plant to grow properly. Another plant that deer may damage. 
This is particularly attractive for use in woodland gardens, as you see here, or for butterfly or pollinator gardens. Pinkster bloom azalea sends out these lovely buds in April just before the leaves open. And these are smooth, deciduous leaves, unlike the evergreen Asian varieties. But this plant more than makes up for that with these showy, fragrant flowers from April to May. And note that these flowers will attract not only butterflies and bees, but hummingbirds. Asian hydrangea is another plant with basically one season of interest. If you would like another shrub with large flowers, I recommend wild hydrangea, our native hydrangea arborescens. Like the Asian hydrangea, this is a mound-shaped plant that grows from canes, about three to six feet tall. This grows in part to full shade. It likes moist soil and will tend to be intolerant of drought. It's very fast growing. You can even cut it down close to the ground in the late winter, and it will send up three to six feet of new growth and will bloom that same year on that new growth. This is particularly lovely when massed in shady shrub border or grouped in a woodland garden. Wild hydrangea has large quilted leaves on unbranched canes and very large flower clusters in June, attracting many pollinators. The bumblebees will just absolutely dance across the surface of these flower clusters. One thing I would recommend, in addition to the fact that this plant also provides seed for birds, is to avoid the sterile mophead cultivars. This particular one pictured here is Annabelle. There are others. As you can see, this is covered with lovely flowers, but these are sterile flowers. They don't have all of the reproductive parts that you see so abundant here on the straight species. If you would like to learn a little bit more about the acceptable lace cap cultivars, you can see a very recent report by Mount Cuba that does plant trials. Someone had questions about a replacement for boxwood. This is a non-native plant a native to Europe, Asia, and Africa, and many plants are in decline. Uh, this can involve either fungi, cold injury, drought stress, and nematodes. Should you want an evergreen shrub, I would recommend our native inkberry holly, Ilex glabra. This, in addition to being evergreen, has a lovely rounded form. It grows six to 10 feet tall, but there are some short cultivars. One of them has already been mentioned. And here is another that's even more diminutive. This is gem box that grows only about two to three feet tall with a lovely rounded shape. This plant grows in sun to part shade and prefers moist to wet soil. Like some of the other native shrubs, it can spread by root suckers. Just be alert that rabbits and deer may browse it. This is lovely for use in a border, as a hedge, as you see here, or for erosion control. Inkberry has glossy evergreen foliage and provides wonderful cover throughout the year for our birds. I've mentioned the word dioecious, and this refers to plants that have separate male and female parts. The spring flowers in this case will appear with the pollen you see here. This is the male flower, and the female flowers will look a little different with a central green nub. And both of these plants will draw bees to the nectar. It will be the male plants that will provide pollen for bees. And when that pollen is carried from male plants to the females, you'll see this fall to winter fruit on the female plants. This fruit feeds 15 local bird species. Another overused plant is cherry laurel. This one is native to Europe and is actually now considered to be invasive on the west coast of the United States. Locally in Northern Virginia, it's on the City of Alexandria invasive watch list. If you would like a native shrub with large spire-like blossoms, I would recommend sweet pepper bush, Clethra alnifolia. This is an upright to rounded shrub, 
about six to 12 feet tall. There are smaller cultivars, the pink flowered ruby spice at four to six feet tall and diminutive hummingbird, a white flowered cultivar two to four feet tall. This plant can grow in a range of sun exposures, but it actually does best in part shade. It distinctly prefers moist to wet soil. Like some of our other native shrubs, it can sucker into colonies. It's lovely for use in butterfly gardens, in rain gardens, or to control erosion. This is another shrub with four season interest. It has lovely quilted leaves, fragrant summer flowers, and these are unusual in that it will be in bloom in July and August, whereas many of the other plants we've been discussing will bloom more in the springtime. And this is another plant that will attract not only bees and butterflies, but also hummingbirds. It has brilliant fall foliage and then winter seed for birds. This will last all the way through to the spring. Another overused plant is Japanese euonymus. This is problematic in that some of the cultivars, which have this multicolored foliage, can actually revert back to the straight species color, the plain green, and it can end up looking rather diseased and mottled, as shown in that little inset picture. If you're looking for a shrub with attractive foliage, I would recommend our native black chokeberry, Aronia melanocarpa, another upright multi stemmed shrub. This one grows three to six feet tall. It has a very attractive small cultivar, low scape mound, that's only 12 to 24 inches tall. It makes a really nice edging plant. It will have the same flowers and the same fruit as the tall straight species. This plant grows in sun to part shade, likes moist soil, and can spread by suckers. You could use it as a hedge or a foundation plant. Black chokeberry has very glossy leaves. They look something like that of our roses, and that's because it is in the rose family. It's a host plant for Lepidoptera, and then its flowers that bloom in April will draw bees and others. They're very lovely. They're five-petaled white flowers with these very distinctive pink anthers. When pollination occurs, it produces a very nutritious summer fruit. It's enjoyed by the birds in the summertime. It's also edible by us, but it is a rather puckering. So you would want to be preparing it for something like jams or jellies or used in baking, where you would use some kind of sweetener. Another overused shrub is yew, native to Europe, Asia, and Africa. All parts of this plant are toxic, including the seeds of its berries. If you're looking for an attractive shrub with berries, I recommend another of our native hollies, winterberry, Ilex verticillata. This plant is upright with a rounded crown. It grows six to 12 feet tall, and there are many cultivars. Some of them include berry poppins and Mr. Poppins, two rather small cultivars, about four feet tall and wide. There is also an orange fruited variety, winter gold. The winter berries prefer sun to part shade conditions for fruiting and like moist to wet acidic soil. This is another plant that can spread by suckering. You could use it as a hedge in a rain garden or to control erosion. You would want to select and plant paired female and male cultivars because that's what's required for the fruiting. And I'll be discussing this a little more in detail shortly. Winterberry is another plant with four season interest. It has lovely quilted leaves that provide cover for birds. It's dioecious with summer flowers on separate male and female plants. Here you see the female flowers. These will offer nectar for bees and butterflies. This particular shrub is especially loved by our native bird species, 48 of them, 
and it has wonderful fruit that will linger on into the winter. It needs to go through a cycle of freezing and thawing. This makes the fruit especially nutritious and very tasty for the birds. It has a high lipid content, and that's what's needed for the birds that either are going to remain here through the colder winter months or who need that good energy for their migration. Now let's take a moment or two to look at some additional native shrubs. I've grouped them, as you can see on your handout, in different clusters. First, we'll look at those that are particularly interesting because of their flowers. The first is buttonbush, Cephalanthus occidentalis. This is a deciduous shrub with a very rounded form, about 6 to 12 feet tall. It grows in sun to part shade, moist to wet soil, and will even tolerate flooding. It's uh, therefore intolerant of drought. You can use this in shrub borders, in rain gardens, or as you see here, beside ponds. Buttonbush has glossy leaves and is a larval host to moths. It has very distinctive fuzzy fragrant flowers looking something like little satellites from early to mid-summer, and these attract many pollinators. It has ball-like fruits that feed both songbirds and waterfowl, and these will linger on as nutlets in the wintertime. Another wonderful native shrub with interesting flowers is mountain laurel, Calmia latifolia. And for those of you who are looking for an evergreen shrub, this is such a plant. It's multi-stemmed and one of the taller shrubs. It grows anywhere from five to 20 feet tall. It prefers part shade and grows in dry to moist acidic soil. Like the azalea I mentioned earlier, it's going to prefer soil with a pH in the acidic range, 4.5 to 6.5. Another thicket forming plant. You could use this in shaded shrub borders and it especially complements any other plants in the rhododendron family. Mountain laurel has these very distinctive clusters of cup-shaped flowers in May, and these will provide nectar and pollen for our native bees. I usually have seen them white with these little raspberry colored dots, but there are also pink varieties. As I mentioned, this is an evergreen plant with very shiny leaves, and it has a very interesting short crooked trunk. It will provide fruit for birds. Another native shrub with interesting flowers is witch hazel, Hamamelis virginiana, another multi-stem shrub, this one with a vase shape. It almost approaches the height of a small tree, 15 to 20 feet tall. It grows in a wide range of sun exposures in moist soil. This one can form colonies. You could use it uh, either as a specimen or a patio tree by pruning away those extending branches, or you could allow it to spread in a woodland area. Witch hazel has oval scalloped leaves, and these will turn a lovely yellow to orange in the fall but its outstanding feature is its flowers, these lovely ribbon-like yellow flowers. This is the latest blooming of our native shrubs and the flowers will be opening in late fall and continue on into early winter. And then the calyxes, the remaining central parts of those flowers will persist into the spring. Now we'll take a look at some native shrubs that offer particularly nutritious fruit. Some of the fruit can be used by us, and in all cases, the fruit is very desirable for our birds. The first is black haw, viburnum prunifolium. This is the tallest of our native viburnums. It grows 12 to 15 feet tall, and you can grow it either as a multi-stemmed specimen or prune it down to a single trunk. It grows in sun to part shade and dry to moist soil and it could spread through suckering if you desire. You can use it as a specimen plant in shrub borders 
or as a hedge or screen. Black haw has very attractive oval leaves providing nourishment to various moths. Like the other viburnums, it has these white flower clusters, very wide, about five inches across from April to May, and these will attract many pollinators. The fruit can be enjoyed by us as well as the birds, and it's really lovely when it ripens and is set against the brilliant fall foliage. Another great native shrub with nutritious fruit is American beautyberry. Calicarpa americana. This is a vased shaped plant with arching branches, three to six feet tall. This one grows in sun to part shade and is intolerant of deep shade. It just won't flower or fruit in those conditions. It likes moist soil. This is a plant because of its somewhat smaller size you could use in a large container uh, in borders or as shown here in open woods. American beautyberry has very large toothed leaves, and it's now being investigated because of some of the chemical components that are good for repelling insects. You'll see these lovely pinkish lavender flowers completely surrounding the stem from June to August, and these will draw bees and butterflies. A really outstanding feature, of course, are these brilliant droops that you'll see in September that provide nourishment for 40 species of songbirds. Now, because there is quite often confusion between the native species and the Japanese species, I've created a short video where I discuss ways that you can very clearly see the distinction between the two, and I've provided a link for that on your handout. Another great shrub with nutritious fruit is highbush blueberry. Many people may not even realize that Vaccinium corymbosum is in fact a native plant. This is deciduous, upright and spreading, growing anywhere from six to 12 feet tall. It grows in sun to part shade, moist to wet soil, and is another ericaceous plant preferring soil in the acidic range. Be alert that deer and rabbits may damage it. This can be used in a shrub border, a native plant garden, or as a hedge. Highbush blueberry has bell-shaped flowers from April to June, and these attract what are referred to as specialist bees. These are native bee species that rely specifically on the pollen of these flowers to provision their nests for their young. Of course, we're all familiar with the edible fruit. And this plant, in addition, has these lovely glossy oval leaves. It's now recommended not only for the flower and fruit benefits, but because this is the highest rated shrub by entomologist Doug Tallamy. He refers to this as one of his keystone plants because it supports a very high number, 288 Lepidoptera species. These are the caterpillar stages of those desirable butterflies and moths. In addition, these leaves will put on a brilliant fall color. Another native shrub with nutritious fruit is spice bush, Lindera benzoin. It has a broad, rounded habit growing anywhere from 6 to 16 feet tall. This is another shrub that can grow in a range of sun exposures, tending to prefer part shade and moist soil. It's especially suited, as you see here, to woodland gardens. It's referred to as the forsythia of the wilds with these lovely spring blossoms. You'll see these early fragrant flowers on separate male and female plants. It's another dioecious species. Its fruit is especially rich in lipids, those fats that the birds rely on to build up bulk for their bird migration. We can also make use of this fruit. It can be dried and used as an allspice substitute. And then you'll see these lovely yellow flowers, aromatic foliage in the fall. Now turning to a group of native shrubs with great fall foliage. 
The first is dwarf Father Gila, Father Gila Gardenii. Note that this is actually more of a southeastern plant. It's scattered from North Carolina through the southeast, but it does grow well in the mid-Atlantic. This photograph was taken all the way up in Pennsylvania. Another multi-stem shrub, this one is more diminutive, three to five feet tall. It grows in sun to part shade, moist to wet soil, and tolerates a range of moisture all the way from drought to flooding. It's very attractive used under flowering or shade trees or as a hedge or foundation plant. Dwarf Father Gilla has scented spring flowers looking something like little bottle brushes, and these will draw bees and native wasps. You'll see these fruit capsules in May, and then it puts on a lovely range of fall color. Another native shrub with great fall foliage is fragrant sumac. Here I'm pointing out the shorter Rus aromatica grow low cultivar. This plant is related to poison ivy. You may be noticing the similarity in the foliage. These plants are both in the Rus genus, but these plants are completely non-toxic. Grow low is a very dense plant growing 18 to 36 inches tall. It's multi-stemmed with long recumbent branches. And as you can see from the spread, it can reach six to eight feet. It does that both by sending out these long, low branches, but then it does what's called tip layering, where it will touch down the branches to the ground. It will root and then send out additional branches from there, making it a wonderful low ground cover. This grows in sun to part shade and dry to moist soil. It's particularly well suited for use in what I refer to as hell strips, those hot, dry, baking uh, curb cuts and, and median strips. This also can be used en masse on slopes for erosion control. Fragrant sumac has glossy trifoliate leaves, and these are aromatic as are its little twigs. You'll see these colorful flowers in April, and then fuzzy fruit in the summer, and brilliant fall foliage. Another native shrub with great fall foliage is yet another of our native viburnums, maple leaf viburnum, viburnum acerifolium. This is a low, densely branched species, only grows about four to six feet tall. It prefers part to full shade, dry to moist soil, and like some of the others, it can sucker to form colonies. This is the most shade tolerant of our native viburnums and is well suited for use in open woodland areas. Maple leaf viburnum can be identified and therefore distinguished from those non-native species by its maple shaped leaves. And this uh, provides nourishment for the spring azure butterfly. It has lovely flower clusters in April, which provide nectar for pollinators. And this fall foliage is very unique with a pinkish purple color. The shrub also provides fruit for birds. Yet another shrub with great fall foliage is oak leaf hydrangea, hydrangea quercifolia. This is another plant that's found a little further south from Tennessee and North Carolina down through the southeast. It's a very broad and upright plant six uh, to eight feet tall and very wide. It grows in sun to part shade and moist soil, another suckering plant. It can be used as an accent or specimen plant in an informal border. And although it is native to that Southern region, it does grow well up here in the mid-Atlantic. It has very large oak shaped leaves giving it its common name and additionally, very large flower clusters. These appear from late May to July. Now you can see here that these are the very showy sterile flowers, but tucked underneath are the sterile flowers and these will provide support for our pollinators. These flowers have an unusual characteristic and then they change from white to pink over the blooming period. 
And then it has absolutely outstanding fall foliage. And this is really providing winter interest with the dried flowers and the exfoliating stems of the plant. Let's quickly take a look at some best practices for our shrubs. First, planting them. Fall is actually a good time to plant shrubs, but if you were to purchase any this spring and to install them before too long, they ought to settle in well before the hot summer weather. When you do that, you would want to untangle and spread out any circling roots. The circling characteristic will particularly occur if you buy plants that have been grown in containers. You'll want to dig a shallow planting hole two to three times as wide as the root ball. This is to encourage horizontal growth. You want not only growth going downwards, but going outwards as well. You'll want to make sure that what is referred to as the trunk flare sits just above the ground level. This is the spot where the trunk of the plant is actually just meeting the roots. A very important thing to note, this is a new recent practice. You want to backfill the hole only with the existing native soil. You don't want to amend it with peat moss, with compost, with leaf mulch. You want to just simply put back the soil that you dug out. The reason for this is that you want to encourage the roots to grow beyond that very enriched area out into the rest of the native soil in your garden. And you can also create a little berm or a catch basin that can help retain the water around the roots as you're first installing it. And speaking of watering, newly planted shrubs need regular consistent watering. You may need to water it even daily for the first couple weeks after planting if there isn't a lot of rain, every few days for a later period. And for the first two years, you want to make sure to water it weekly, providing the equivalent of an inch of rain. Note that some shrubs may wilt in the hot afternoon sun. Our native hydrangea is particularly one of those. And also watch out for early morning wilting. As far as mulching your shrubs, be sure to use no more than a three inch layer. Deep mulch can cause a number of problems. It can prevent movement of water that's coming in down into the root ball that needs the moisture. It also can reduce oxygen levels causing suffocation of the roots. It can lead to root growth high up near the ground rather than going down low and there will be a circling around the plant in the mulch and keeping poorly drained soils too wet will lead to root rot. You can also use ground covers as kind of a green mulch. And I've got some suggestions for that. You may want to see a recording for a presentation I gave recently called Native Ground Covers for Sun and Shade. You'll see numerous suggestions in that recording. As I mentioned, some of our plants, like winterberry and inkberry, are dioecious species. That means that they have the separate male and female plants. When you get these plants, you'll want to plant them within 40 to 50 feet in order for the pollen to be carried to the female plant and for that plant to bear fruit. You need to get plants that will be blooming at the same time and one male can service up to 10 female plants. Look for paired cultivars. For example, you might get Ilex verticillata red sprite, which is a female plant, and match it with Ilex verticillata jim dandy, the male cultivar. Some additional special considerations for fruiting. The viburnums are monoecious. They're not dioecious, but these plants are not self-fertile. They require cross-pollination between genetic variants of the same species to produce fruit. So these viburnum dentatum, for example, I have three of them planted near my walkway at the front garden. And these are all wild type, but they were chosen from multiple nurseries. They were not cloned plants. And therefore, there can be pollination going back and forth between the three of those. Another alternative would be to choose two different cultivars of a species that bloom at the same time. So if you were choosing the 
Possum Haw Viburnum Nudum, you could look for Viburnum Nudum Brandywine and Viburnum Nudum Winterter to cross-pollinate. To finish up, I'd like to show you just quickly a little slideshow of some foundation plantings with native shrubs. This is a Virginia Sweet Spire outside our Master Gardener headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. Oakleaf hydrangea bordered by male and female winterberry at our Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden. This photo taken at an office complex shows how native shrubs such as inkberry and sweet pepper bush can even be clipped into a slightly more formal look. One of my master gardener colleagues has oak leaf hydrangea and uses that grow low cultivar of fragrant sumac as a wonderful low ground cover plant. Another master gardener has a whole range of native plants native shrubs mixed in with some herbaceous plants in her front yard, including the arborvitae, which I mentioned is a native shrub. In her backyard, she has inkberry and black haw on the back and then on the side, inkberry again. This is my front yard with arrowwood, oak leaf hydrangea there by the front steps and inkberry, there are three of them by the fence. This shows the side yard from two different directions with multiple plants as foundation plants. And this shows an even more recent photo with my viburnum plants toward the front, Virginia sweet spire bordering my garage, which is just out of the picture to the left, and a whole range of not only native trees, but native shrubs as foundation plants. For resources, just a reminder that you can always go to our Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website and look for fact sheets under the Plants menu tab. And this is just a closer look at what the fact sheets will look like should you follow the links on the handout. I have separate series for invasive plants and better alternatives, and then those that are purely the native plants referred to as the tried and true fact sheets. I mentioned an upcoming presentation for those of you who really want to learn more about the differences between using straight plant species and the various cultivars that will be coming up in May. Should you want to see plants, I invite you, if you're here in the Northern Virginia area, please come by and check out our Master Gardener Demonstration Gardens, where quite a few of these photographs were taken. In addition, there's many wonderful public gardens. These happen to be in the Washington metropolitan area, but Longwood Gardens, some of the other wonderful gardens in Pennsylvania, Ginter down in Richmond, North Carolina, Norfolk Botanical Garden. These are all wonderful locations where you can see native plants. For those who are interested in buying native plants, I'm providing a link for those of us who are up in the Northern Virginia area to the Plant Nova Natives website. They have two sections. One lists native only sellers, and they also list native plant sales seasonally. And for those of you who are local, please come by our spring celebration and plant sale on April 20. For those who are attending this session, uh, from out of state or out of this Northern Virginia region, I highly recommend you check for the appropriate Native Plant Society websites for whatever state you reside in. And now we can take some final questions. The first question is, is black chokeberry a good alternative to privets? Yes, as you'll see, if you follow the links for the invasive plant fact sheets, you will discover that for today's presentation, I've just recommended one plant, but there can be multiple native plants that could be alternatives for, for quite a number of the invasive plants. So yes, that is a, a very attractive plant. It has lovely, very glossy foliage. It will be dense. It will provide a nice place for birds to rest and nest. And then, of course, it will have those other wonderful features as far as the flowers and the fruit. The next question is, 
Can you plant oak leaf hydrangea in a container? It's a fairly large plant. As I mentioned, it's about six to eight feet tall and it's quite wide. So it's going to have a fairly large root system. I would recommend just using it either as a foundation plant, maybe a specimen plant, or as part of a hedge. I didn't mention this, but there are shorter cultivars of that particular plant, and those would be more appropriate for use in a large container. Okay, I believe that's all for today's questions. I hope today's presentation has maybe answered some of the questions that you came with. It's maybe broadened the palette of plants that you might consider introducing into your own gardens. As I've mentioned, I'll be happy to answer some of these questions in even more detail. So look for that addendum document to come out within about a week or so. One last question just came in. Any suggestions for removing invasive shrubs? There are several things you can do. One is to go to the section of the website. It's on the bottom of the first page of the handout where I say list of invasive plants with techniques for management. There you'll see all kinds of suggestions on very authoritative websites on how to control different plants because different ones can be controlled in different ways. I go into some detail in this, in that presentation, invasive plants and native alternatives, and that a part on control begins at one hour and seven minutes into that presentation. So you can just zero right into that one part. But let me just summarize some of that right now. With some of our herbaceous plants, they can be dug out fairly easily. The shrubs pose a little bit more of a problem. One thing you can do is certainly to try to control them before they're going to flower. You don't want the pollinators to be drawn to them instead of to native flowering plants. Certainly before they fruit, because you don't want that fruit to be eaten by birds and then carried and excreted in our natural areas. What you can do is cut the shrubs down close to the ground and you can get an herbicide. There's information about specific ones by following the link I provide. And you do what's called painting. You want to cut them, brush away any sawdust from the sawing process, paint that exposed surface of the invasive plant. And that will be taken in systemically into the roots of the plant and should kill it back. And then you should be able to dig it up. Some of these plants, as I've mentioned at several points, will send up re-sprouting, and so you may need to treat them several times. If you're lucky enough to have a device called a weed wrench, this is what the professionals will use to deal with very big infestations of invasive plants in the understory of our forest. You can actually use that tool to to grab the plant and just literally wrench it out of the ground. It's a very powerful tool that can be used to kind of lever the plant out. So those are a couple of options that you can look into. Well, everyone, I wish you happy gardening. <laughs>